To avoid acting with precipitation, he determined to consult with his wisest advisors. A kind of privy council was called together with this object in view. As soon as he had read General Muncy's report, the two consuls, the grand judge, the minister of foreign affairs, the councillor of state, Riel and Fouché, although the latter was not a minister, composed this council. Fouché has succeeded in making himself necessary by his extreme activity. He used often to come and tell the first consul news, which he had obtained thanks to the influence which he had retained over the police agents and the confidences which he extracted from them, beating the grand judge in his own department. As no official report was made of the deliberations of this council, the opinions of the various persons who took part in it having been made the subject of conjecture. It appears, however, certain, and this fact will be established or otherwise in the memoirs, which sooner or later cannot fail to be published, that the two consuls showed themselves little disposed towards immediate severe measures, and that Fouché, on the other hand, did not hide his opinion that it was necessary to make a prompt example so as to finish with the conspirators. I will mention later on what influence Monsieur de Talleyrand exercised on the determination of the First Consul. Napoleon hesitated a long time as to how to act in so serious a matter. His first idea had been to have the Duc d'Anguillon tried at the same time and on the same indictment as George. He was loth, however, to couple a prince with a man whom he considered a common murderer. His next thought of giving great importance to the prince's trial by bringing him before a high court. Various considerations, and notably the fear of provoking party manifestations, induced him to abandon this plan, which would perhaps have been the best. He at last made up his mind to replace the slow and solemn forms of civil proceedings by the rapid and secret action of a court-martial, a formidable weapon which would strike terror into the hearts of his enemies. He had always in reserve the rights of clemency. Such was the state of affairs when on the 19th Vontos of the year 7, March 10th, 1804, a day on which I had not dined at the Tuileries, I was sent for at 10 o'clock at night by order of the first consul. I found him on my arrival in a room adjoining his study, a number of maps which he had thrown down on the floor in looking for the one of the Rhine were at his feet. After helping him to spread his maps out on a large mahogany table, which was in the middle of the room, I wrote from his dictation a letter to the Minister of War, Berthier, giving him orders to send off that night his aide-de-camp, General Calincourt, to Strasbourg, and General Ordner, commander of the mounted grenadiers of his guard, to Schlestadt, to proceed to the arrest of the Duke d'Anguillon. Whilst the First Consul was dictating this letter, General Berthier was announced, and shortly afterwards, General Calincourt. The First Consul dictated the rest of the instructions concerning this expedition to General Berthier, tracing on the map the route to be followed by General Ordner. He then dictated a letter to Monsieur Talleyrand, prescribing the diplomatic measures to be taken. By the terms of this order, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was to hand General Calincourt a letter addressed to Baron Dettelsheim, Minister of the Elector of Baden, which was to be delivered at its address by the officer as soon as he had heard of the arrest of the Duke Dongyong. It was stated in his letter that the Minister of Foreign Affairs had previously addressed to the electoral government a note tending to a demand for the arrest of the Committee of French Exiles in session at Offenburg. When the first consul, by the successive arrival of brigands, sent into France by the English government, as well as by the developments and results of the prosecutions instituted in France, had received definite assurance of the part played by the English agents in the terrible conspiracies against his person and the safety of France, that he had moreover learned that the Duc d'Anguillon and General de Murier were at Ettenheim, and that as it was impossible that they could be in that town without the permission of his electoral highness, the first consul had been able to contemplate without the greatest grief the sight of a prince to whom he had been pleased to give the clearest proofs of his sincere friendship, harboring his most sincere 
his most bitter enemies, and allowing the most evident conspiracies to be quietly plotted against him, that under these most unusual circumstances, the First Consul had thought it his duty to give orders to two small detachments to make their way to Offenburg and to Ettenheim, to seize the persons of the instigators of a crime, which by its very nature placed those who had palpably taken part in it outside all human law, that General Calancourt was charged with the orders of the First Consul, and that there could be no doubt that in his execution of them, he would in no way be wanting in the respect which his highness might consider due to himself. The instructions contained in the letter addressed by the First Consul to the Minister of War provided that General Calancourt should betake himself to Strasbourg and from there to Offenburg with 200 dragoons to arrest the exiles and the agents of the English government, that General Ordner should proceed to Schellestadt, where he would take 300 dragoons and pass over the Rhine with them to Rheinau, secretly surrounding the castle of Ettenheim and arresting the Duke d'Anguillon, and especially de Maurier, together with all persons found with them. General Calicor was to put himself in communication with General Ordner, and as soon as he had heard of his arrival at Ettenheim to send Monsieur Talleyrand's minister's letter to the minister of the Elector of Baden with apologies for the violation of his territory, which was necessitated by the urgency of the matter and the need of absolute secrecy. Here is the scene, if I may so express myself, of this memorable evening. The First Consul Berthier, the Minister of War, General Calancourt, and myself were assembled in a large room in the Tuileries Palace, which had been used as a bedroom by Louis XVI, and which afterwards was used for a similar purpose by the Emperor. This room was lighted only by three, two three-branched candelabra, covered with shades so that the light of the candles illuminated a circumference of a few feet only. The minister and I wrote by the light of one of these candelabra on a corner of the large mahogany table. The first consul, lighted by the other flambeau, bending over the map, called General Calancourt up to his side and compass in hand, showed him the route from Strasbourg to Rheinau, pointing out the exact position of the ferry which joins the two banks of the Rhine, that of the village of Ettenheim, and the road which leads to it. When on the evening of the day in which the first consul had sent for me, I arrived at the Tuileries. I did not know what people he had seen in the afternoon. I learned that he had conversed with the consuls, with the ministers of justice, and of foreign affairs, and with Fouché. Two days later, Fouché, as he was coming from the levee, said to me, General Bonaparte is very indiscreet. He will end by letting the cat out of the bag. He was alluding to the order for the Duke d'Anguillon's arrest. The first consul had spoken at his levee of the matter which exclusively engrossed his thoughts of the machinations of the exiles, whose proximity he tolerated with too great patience, and had mentioned the names of the Duke d'Anguillon and of de Maurier. Nobody in the consular household, however, not accepting Madame Bonaparte knew of the orders that had been given. The first consul remained some days in Paris and then left the Tuileries for La Malmaison. Although my carriage followed his, he gave me an escort of some soldiers for the greater safety of his papers. The entire population of Paris showed an interest in the various incidents of this drama, which can hardly be conceived today. The arrest of George which had taken place almost simultaneously with the order for the seizure of the Duc d'Anguillon, had dispelled all uncertainty as to the existence of a conspiracy and raised to the highest degree the general solicitude for and sympathy with the head of the state. It was earnestly prayed that the instigators of the conspiracy might be taken and severely punished. During his stay at La Maison, the first consul appeared careworn and indisposed for any occupation. He only received Messrs. Marais, Talleyrand, Fouché, Riel, and the Grand Judge, Renier, and Cambaceres. On the 25th Ventos, March 16th, the Telegraph announced that the Duc d'Anguillon had been arrested in the night at the castle of Edenheim. Orders were immediately given that he should be brought to Paris, where he arrived on the 29th Ventos. The first consul was fully informed as to the details of the conspiracy. He was aware of the order of the King of England's Privy Council convoking the exiles of the Condé army to the right bank of the Rhine 
under penalty of forfeiting the allowances attached to their rank, an edict which coincided with the presence of the Duc d'Anguillon in the same place, and that of George and his assassins in Paris. The revelations which were contained in the letters seized on the exiles at Ettenheim, Offenburg, and other points on the right bank of the Rhine, letters which had been sent on to him by special couriers, the reports which he had caused to be drawn up, and the information which he had collected on all sides, had dispelled his last doubts. Amongst the papers seized were a note from the Duc d'Anguillon, in answer to a letter from a certain general called Valborel, from which it was gathered that the prince had refused to follow the advice given him by this general to absent himself in consequence of the dangers to which under the existing circumstances he was exposed, and a letter from a colonel named de Lenin, which contains similar advice. If, as I think, this officer added, the energetic views of the governments which protect us so particularly are recognized by the great powers as the only means of restoring tranquility to Europe by means of peace on equitable conditions. These conditions will naturally be the restoration of the monarchy. These papers proved the plan of hostility, which had been conceived against the French government, the part taken by the Duc d'Anguillon, in his plan and his relations with the exiles who were stationed on the right bank of the Rhine. Fouché had declared that a portmanteau full of papers which would reveal all the ramifications of the conspiracy would be found at the prince's house. But no such portmanteau was discovered at Ettenheim. Fouché's assertion was only conjecture, though it may be that the Duc d'Anguillon had been persuaded by the advice of his faithful officers expressing their fears lest a descent might be made on Ettenheim to remove to a place of safety all papers which may compromise his companions whilst remaining himself at the post of danger. The following note, which the First Consul sent to the Moniteur on the day of the Prince's arrival in Paris, and which appeared in the following day's paper, gives a recapitulation of what he had learned. Paris, 20th Ventose, Year 7, March 19th, 1804. Whilst England was sending Pichigrew, George, and the gang of murderers to Paris, she was assembling and hiring the services of all the exiles, who were to be found in Germany. A circular from the Prince de Condé summoned them about three months ago. It is a fact known to the whole town of Hamburg that a man named Milar, who was entrusted with funds in this town to recruit those wretches and to send them onto the Rhine, the right back. Bank of the Rhine is filling daily with these new legionaries, whom England summons to be at once the toys and victims of her cruel Machiavellianisms. A Bourbon prince with his staff as certain officers is fixed at this point and thence directs the movement. The Prince de Guimene and several officers are expected to arrive on March 25th to complete the organization of the bands. The continental powers make haste to disavow such elements of disorder, and the new attempt of the British government will not be any more successful than the crime which it prepared at such great expense against the First Consul. The Duc d'Anguillon arrived at the Villette Barrier of Paris towards 3 o'clock in the afternoon on March 20th. He was detained there until the order arrived directing his removal to the Fort of Vincennes. He arrived at Vincennes prison at five o'clock in the evening. On the same day, a decree was issued ordering that the C. devant Duc d'Anguillon, accused of having taken up arms against the Republic, of having been and being still in the pay of England, of forming part of the conspiracies fomented by this power against the safety of the Republic at home and abroad, should be brought before a court-martial composed of seven members nominated by the military governor of Paris that said court-martial to meet at Vincennes. By the terms of this decree, the five colonels of the infantry and cavalry regiments in the garrison of Paris, the major of the regiment of the gendarmerie d'élite, acting as reporter, and General Houlin, the city marshal of Paris, were designed by the governor of Paris to form the court-martial. These officers betook themselves separately to Vincennes. Silence having been observed as to the name of the prisoner whom they were to try, it was only there that they learned that it was the Duc d'Anguillon. 
They were all in ignorance of the various circumstances of the conspiracy, but all alike were under the impression of the general indignation which had been excited by the plan of an attack on the person of the First Consul, as well as by the prospect of the chaotic disorder which would have followed on his death. They did not imagine that these plots had been under the direction of a prince of the former dynasty. The captain, reporter, Dutincourt, proceeded to a first examination of the prince. The duke, deploring the cruel extremity to which he was reduced, expressed a desire to be heard by the first consul. Dutincourt advised him to write a request for an audience at the foot of the report of his examination. The prince's note was in the following words. Before signing this official report of my examination, I earnestly request a private interview with the First Consul. My name, my rank, my way of thinking, and the horror of my situation lead me to hope that he will not refuse my re signed request. L.A.H. de Bourbon. This touching appeal to the clemency of a generous enemy was never to reach the man to whom it was addressed. The document in question was placed before the members of the military commission. Only one of the judges, namely General Barrois, expressed the opinion that the request for an audience should be transmitted to the First Consul. But the answers of the Duke d'Anguillon, the circumstances with which his arrest was surrounded, the conviction of the members of the court that the prince was the accomplice and even the leader of the plot that was being hatched in Paris seemed to officers judging with the rigor of the military penal code sufficient reasons for applying the law to the prince, his right of appeal to the first consul after sentence being reserved. Honorable men such as the members of the court martial were would not have stopped to allow their consciences to waver in the face of such a sanguinary order. The first consul, whose mind was made up, had no doubt that the prince would be condemned, but there was no doubt that he expected that, should an incident arise, he would be referred to before the execution of the sentence was carried out. The proof of this is that at the same time he ordered his secretary of state, Marais, who was then staying at La Malmaison, and who returned for this purpose to Paris to write a letter to the councillor of state, Rial ordering him to proceed to Vincennes and to personally examine the Duke d'Anguillon and then to come and report the results of the examination to him, Napoleon. Monsieur Marais, if I remember rightly, left La Maison for Paris towards seven in the evening, and it must have been about 10 o'clock when this letter was handed in at Monsieur Riel's house. But the same fatality, which seems to have presided over the whole course of events in this affair, Rial, who for the last eight days had not had a moment's rest and who had passed several nights without going to bed and that day come in broken down with fatigue. He had forbidden his valet to wake him before five o'clock in the morning, no matter what message might be sent him. A letter coming from the state secretary's office did not seem of sufficient importance to warrant a disobedience of Mr. Rial's formal orders that he was not to be waked. Amongst the letters which were handed him at his wakening was that of the Secretary of State. He dressed with all speed and sent out for Vincennes. But on his way there, he met Colonel Savary, who informed him that the Duke d'Anguillon's execution had taken place. Savary, who was on horseback, continued on his way to La Malmaison, arriving there at eight in the morning. He was at once ushered into the first consul's study where I was present. Savary related the sentence and its execution in a few words. On hearing that, the Duke d'Anguillon had asked to see him, the first consul, without asking for any of those details of which he was usually so greedy, interrupted Savary to ask what had become of Riel and to know if he had not gone to Vincennes. Hearing that he had not gone there, Napoleon remained silent, walking up and down his library with his hands crossed behind his back until the moment when Monsieur Riel was announced. After listening to the latter's explanation and having exchanged a few words with him, he fell back into his reverie, and then without expressing a word either of approval or blame, he took his hat and said, It is well, leaving Monsieur Riel surprised and to some extent disturbed by his manner. We heard the first consul slowly ascending the staircase, which led to the little apartment which he occupied over his library. He shut himself up there and did not appear again for a long time.